Hello and welcome to Find Happiness Podcast. Today we are honored to have Eleanor M. Ward, also known as Coach E. Eleanor has personally experienced the tragedy of grief, losing her husband and eldest son in a tragic car accident, which led her to becoming a passionate advocate for those who are struggling with pain and loss. She will share her wisdom and insights on how to navigate grief and find hope and healing in the midst of tragedy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah. So how are you doing today? Woke up with a little bit of a headache, but um, other than that, it's, it's, once I got moving and grooving, I was, I was doing better. So doing pretty good for a Monday. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. And so I how like are you. This. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I like the smiles and then I like the hair. It reminds me of so Glow <laughs> coming to America. <laughs> My hair is always different, so you always get a different look. <laughs> this is the look oh, right nice. now. Okay, okay. This is for now. Tomorrow we'll see something else. Yes, for now. I hope you know we're getting it'll back like on the show. It'll be this, this look for a minute. <laughs> Okay. But it changes every couple months, put it like that. All right, all right. Okay, so I, I wrote down a few questions for you, and are you ready? So I am. One, yeah, okay. So can you tell me about your personal experience with grief and how it led you to become a grief expert and a coach? Oh my goodness, um, I want to condense it. Um, my personal experience with grief was just horrific. Uh, my husband passed, my son passed, um, I had my youngest son, and I had no idea how to deal with it. And I didn't have any familial support from my family. They did nothing to help at all. Um, so I went through a great rough patch for probably the first decade after they passed. They passed in 2006. When you don't have any support and you don't know what to do, you're trying to fix yourself and it doesn't work. I had suicidal thoughts. I had suicidal moments where it couldn't have been anything but God that stopped me in my tracks. And I tell people, be thankful for suicide hotlines because some countries don't have them. And the one day that I was really just worn out, tired, I was not, grief puts you in a fog because I was not in the right headspace. My son was still small then. I think he might have been 13 or 14 at the time. But he, when they died, he was 11. And um, <clears throat> I remember just thinking, this isn't working. Without his dad, without his brother, I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm not cut out to be a single mom. I'm not cut out to be a breadwinner. And I remember going down into my garage and getting in the car. And in that moment, I thought, if I turn the car on, it'll be quiet, nobody will know. And then I heard this voice say, do you really want your son to find you this way? And you are stronger than this. And so in that moment, I stopped, I picked up my, my cell phone, I called the suicide hotline and I talked to them. I don't remember how long and um, it kind of helped stop me in my tracks. And then um, I had to go back upstairs and kind of pull myself together. My son never knew anything about it. He knows the story now because he hears me tell it now, but he's grown up now and he's just like, I had no clue. And so um, it was rough. And so probably it was just about three years ago, I said, this is not working. I wasn't so overwhelmed as I was, but I knew I was way down really heavy with the grief still. And I, these days I still wasn't functioning properly. So I started going to um, a grief counseling group in my church. And I had been to counseling and all that, and it had done nothing to help. And um, that started pulling things out of me because they handled the grief in a different way, I guess more connected with God. And I started to change my thinking, and I started looking around, and I was saying, there's really nothing out here. Doesn't matter about the counselors, doesn't matter about all this stuff. There's really nothing out here to help people who are handling grief by themselves or struggling through it. Um, you don't go through the six stages of grief when you have a, a, a what I call a um, non-terminal illness. 
So that's when I started working on a program. And I said, the first person I'm putting through the program is myself. And I started what I call the grief management program, where you learn to manage your grief because I came to understand I'll never get over it. <clears throat> I'll never get past it. I have to manage it in order to have a life. And so that's what started me coaching and um, trying. And this year I decided I need to get my message out here more. And that's what I'm doing now to let people know there's other ways to handle your grief. And this way you can handle your grief. Love another person, live your life and enjoy your life again because my life was just not happy. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. This this is deep. This is deep. It is. It's okay. It's okay. This is deep. Um so there's a word I picked out while you were talking and it's one thing that comes to a lot of people that get depressed, that get grieved by you know, different circumstances in life. And it's the word suicide. Yeah. So you had suicidal thoughts, right? Yes. Yeah, so so this is the question. Were, were you were you hearing words? Were you hearing words and what, what pattern? Say the last part again for me. So were you hearing words like, hey, you could commit suicide and all that? No, no, it was more of me kind of my head. I was just exhausted. I didn't have any help from anybody. And I was just exhausted. I didn't think I was doing a good job as a mom. Um, I felt like I was failing my kid. So it was more so me. He just being like, you know what, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I, I'm not doing it well. And I felt like I was damaging my son. And um, I was going through it with my husband's family. They were acting crazy. And they had been acting crazy for quite a few years after he died. And so, oh, I, you know, you get <clears throat> mentally exhausted. And that's where I was. I was just mentally exhausted, never having a break. And my son and I were at that point together all the time. And I'm sure he needed a break from mom too. He was in high school and he was going through normal teenage kid stuff at that time. And so never having anybody to pull in and say, hey, I had nobody to tag me out. Go go have a drink, go out to dinner. We know you're doing this. And my family came back years later and apologized as far as not helping me, but who cares? I needed the help then, not, not 10 years later. So, no, no real voice, it's just the exhaustion and me saying, enough, I don't want to do this anymore. Because wow. I felt like I couldn't do it without us as a unit, as a whole family. I get you, I get you. I'm, I'm so sorry you went through that, but that has made you who you are right now. Mm -hmm. And you're a very strong person, and this is the most important thing you're doing right now, helping people get out of grief. Speaking to that, losing a loved one is, one of the most difficult experiences anyone can go through. However, how do you help your clients manage their grief and find a way forward? Well, the beauty of the grief management program is we can customize it and tailor it to the person. And so, you know, I went through grief with um, a massive car accident and losing my family in that way. We were all together. So, that's a lot when you're all together and half your family dies. Someone else may have gone through a gunshot situation. Someone else may have gone through something else. And so I tailor six, eight, and 12 week programs. Everybody's not gonna wanna be able to do a full 12 weeks in the beginning. You can always come back. And people say, well, why do you have a short program, a long program? Because there's some people that are ready for six weeks and where it can take them and they see the changes. And they may feel that's enough because they don't wanna be overwhelmed. And some people need the full 12 weeks to really digest it and the eight week is just kind of in the middle. So I give them that, we make a plan, we have a discovery call and I help them understand the program. We will not be going into the six stages of grief. I respect it, but that's for people that have had terminal illnesses. What we're gonna do is show you how to manage your grief. You're gonna learn what triggers you, what times of the year upset you. You're gonna learn um, about what you're thinking, how you're feeling, how to connect with your own thought process. 
how to even identify when you may feel like you want to check out and it's a lot of different things and for people that say they never thought that when someone dies more power to you but a lot of people sadly do have those feelings that they don't want to necessarily be here so we talk about those things and so what I do is I give you a management plan to get through all of that and as you work through those weeks this is a plan you'll be able to use the rest of your life to manage your grief I don't cry the way I used to I don't fall apart the way I used to. I have moments here and there, but I now know what to connect those to, what holidays will make me feel that way. So there are some things that I avoid. There are some people I don't go around because some people you go around bring the grief out in you even more. And those may not be people you need to be around all the time. So um, that's kind of what we do to help you to begin to understand it's not gonna go. You're never not gonna miss your babies. You're never not gonna miss your husband or your wife or whoever it may be. So for someone to tell you, oh, just get over it. How in the world are you supposed to do that? Grief is not something you get over. So I teach you how to live with it, but to have your life at the same time. And when you learn how to live with it, then you can learn to share your grief with other people around you and your family and say, hey, I'm having a bad day. Can I just have a little bit of a break? or I'm thinking about such and such today, or you can kind of guide your life and people go, oh, I didn't realize that. Let's let's do this, that, or the other to help you make it through the day. So that helps you still have a life as well. Oh, awesome. So um, what you just said now, you've answered a few questions that I have in mind. So I'm, I'm going to jump to something close. Well, okay, so what are some common misconceptions about grief that you often encounter in, in your work? Oh my goodness, the first one is going to be the six stages of grief. And everybody thinks that you're supposed to go through. I'm that client and say, well, I haven't done stage three or stage five. And I go, well, was the per person in your life in terminal illness? And they're like, no, I lost them through a heart attack or something. And I go, well, why would you go through the six stages of grief? That has nothing to do with every day. I said, that was a research program by a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Love her to death, think she did great research. She sat in a facility for six months with people who had terminal illnesses and she researched with the families and that's what she came across. I think it still works for people with terminal illnesses, but if you don't have a terminal illness, you're not going to go through the six stages of grief. Not you, but the people in your family. If someone dies in an instant or dies in their sleep unexpectedly, you're not going to go through that. You may go through something like that, but you're not. You're in it. The person is gone, it's immediate, it's done. You don't have six months to do bargaining and acceptance and all that. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions that you have to go through six stages of grief. You do not, and most of the time you won't. I wouldn't go through, I didn't go through any of those. They died in a car accident, death was immediate, boom, I didn't go through any of that stuff. So that's what made me realize we still have to have other things out here. The other misconception is getting over it. Everybody will tell you to get over it and move on. Get over what? I was married for 20 years. I can't just get over not having a husband in a minute. I can't just get over not having a child in an instant. So, um, I don't know about Africa, but in the United States, they push for you to just act like it didn't happen, move forward, and what happens is years later, the person falls apart or has a nervous breakdown. So um, those are the biggest misconceptions that you can just get over it. You're gonna go through the stages and you're just gonna go on to life. That's not how grief works. Well, great. Okay, so speaking to this misconception and the six stages of grief, um, would you walk us through your program? Your program is already accredited, uh, which saves lives and helps people. So just give us like a pathway through your through this journey can you walk us through the program and how it works um basically i sit down with you initially and we have a discovery call i find out what the grief is connected to who it is that you lost and then i look at the trauma that may be connected to it before i make up your program and there is always trauma connected to grief and so um i find out how you know how the person got all that stuff and then um, we go from there as far as deciding if you want to do six, eight, or 12 weeks in the program. And once we do that, I, I uh, 
I put together a course roster for you, what we're going to do every single week. And we meet every week. And then you also have homework to do and okay. things that you have to take care of. And um, typically we meet again at the end of the week, whether that's just phone call or a quick text message. But we have one big meeting once a week uh, on Zoom. And okay. then by the time the end of your program, six, eight or 12 weeks, whatever that case may be, um, we look at the progress you've made, what has happened, how you've applied the things that I've given you. So basically in a, in a nutshell, I'll just say, we'll, we'll just do six weeks. First week, we're gonna look at the tra tragedy, how it's affected you. Second week, how have you handled it? Whether it's new, old, in between. Third week, we then look at um, what makes you feel this way and what times of the year make you feel this way. Fourth week, we then look at you know, how are you going to talk to your family about how you're going to be handling your grief in a different manner? And then week six, we review everything, go every, every, over everything, and then we talk about um, what is going to make you understand the grief is going to be with you and to realize how it's going to be with you. We journal throughout each of the weeks, and this helps the person to see things that sometimes you can't see just talking about it. You can see more when you write stuff down. And so week six, we do a big review. I ask if you want to move forward. If not, some people take that information and they feel that's enough of a changer, game changer for them and their grief, and they go on. So that's kind of the small program. Well, okay. Okay. So I think that you must have worked with a lot of people over, over time and your experience in this one. Um, you would have really got a lot, that's just what I'm trying to say. So, how has your experience of grief influenced your coaching lifestyle and approach to helping others generally? Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people think if you are dealing with grief, you're not supposed to cry, you're never supposed to feel anything. Um, the one thing before I started being a grief coach, I was trying to do all this other stuff as a coach and it wasn't happening. And I finally said, you know, whatever they're feeling, I have to feel too. And so if you're crying, most of the time I'm crying with you. If you are upset, I, I feel you, I'm upset too. And it's not because I can't control my emotions because you can't be a grief coach and think that you are, are never supposed to feel anything. You're going to feel all the feels. If somebody's hugging me and talking about their mom or their grandma, most of the time they get me, I'm, I'm already crying. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I do the best that I can. I tell this, hey, this coach, she's going to be in there crying with you. I remember a lady was hugging me and talking about a fire where she had lost everything and um, lost a family member. And I was just boo-hooing. And we were in her um, driveway. And I pulled myself together. Uh, but I was crying out in the driveway with her. After that, I put my coach hat back on. She had my empathy hat for a minute. I put my coach hat back on. And we had to walk in the house and make a list of things and do things. And so we got it together and we did that. But she said, I needed that moment that you were with me and you cried with me. She said it just, she felt like that just soothed her soul. And then we got down to the business of taking care of things she needed to take care of to move on in, in her life. Because I also, it's something new I'm going to start. I'm going to be helping people understand how to navigate um, the, some of the legal things you have to deal with at, with grief. Because I know I got really done bad, badly by my husband's family legally. So I'm trying to put that together soon. But yeah, that's, that's going to happen. So I try to be empathetic. I try to understand. Yeah. Um, Everybody, every story is not necessarily true. Sometimes you're dealing with the villain in the story, but they have a right to get past their grief too. So it is what it is. You're going to cry. You're going to feel a little bit worn out. But a lot of times, uh, even when I teach some of the Zoom classes with a group, um, and people will just be like, oh, that was so much. And I was crying and I came off camera. Because I used to get upset when I would teach some of the group classes. And I'm like, where's everybody at? And then the moderator would come back and say, oh, a lot of them were crying. And they came off, off camera. So now I just respect, if you want to go off camera during one of the group classes, you can. 
and then I get a lot of feedback after. So things happen and that doesn't mean people can't process what you're saying, it just means it's touching them and it's the first time somebody is getting it. Okay, so I picked the word, like dealing with people in such cases, you have to be very empathetic, get in their shoes, try to feel exactly how they feel the best way you can. And sometimes you might have to cry, not because you're forcing it. <laughs> That's a whole lot of work. That's a whole lot of work. Some of the, anyway. some of the stories are rough. <laughs> some yeah. of the stories are really rough. I, I know that. <laughs> There are some people I've interviewed, right? And um, you know, listening to what they're saying, we just keep quiet. Okay, there was a lady I interviewed and she said something. Um, so since it's like a, a pre-recorded stuff, I said, just excuse me for a moment. And I went off the camera to wipe my eyes because it was really, really yes. so touching. Yeah, it was really so touching. Like, well, maybe I would have just cried on the camera, maybe. Just maybe, but <laughs> yeah, it, it can be. Uh, it's wow. yeah. And oh. I, you know, I feel exhausted sometimes, but overall, usually when I'm done, you know, helping someone or coaching or, or even if we're just doing a discovery call, because the discovery calls, whoo, those are a lot. Um, I don't know. I still feel when I get off, I feel energetic. I feel inspired, and I'm ready to help the next person. So I, I, I'm growing to love it. <laughs> Have you had an experience where someone someone's talking to you and then you're crying more than the person and maybe the person will be like, wow, <laughs> I'm supposed to be the one crying here. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Or sometimes I'm fighting it and I'm just like, I'll finally just say, give me a second. <laughs> and they go, oh no, it's fine. And they're not crying. And I'm just like, geez, how are you not crying? <laughs> So I've, yeah, I've definitely had that experience. Yeah, I, I noticed that at the beginning of the show you you, you, you wiped a little. I didn't want I didn't want to make that noise, but that's fine. That's I had, uh, Go ahead. A guy I dated tell me I had the saddest eyes he had ever seen, and I said, "Well, I probably do because they're never going to be happy eyes because they've seen so much, and so." I was like, oh well, and he's not around anymore, so who cares? But <laughs> I probably do. So I, I said, I think that's the, the after effect that I'll always have a little bit of a sadness look. And I was like, I looked in my eyes and I said, oh, they do look kind of sad. But I, I, overall, I'm a happy chick, so it's okay. <laughs> wow. Thanks for the wisdom and insights. So, okay. So I believe you have worked with a lot of people. So can you share like the success story of someone who has worked with you, who was able to navigate through? Uh, well, I had a lady that um, I consider her a success story. Um, she called me and she had um, lost her husband through um, addiction. And she said, I'm stuck on stage, whatever. I forget what stage, stage something in the group. And I just listened to her and I said, oh, okay. And um, I said, well, why do you feel like you are putting yourself through stages? She said, well, I thought that's what I had to do and I can't get past the stage. And I said, well, have you ever thought about putting that to the side and actually focusing on getting help with your grief? And she was like, well, that's what I'm doing when I called you. I said, well, I don't do six stages of grief. I said, so we can either dig in the grief while you're holding on to it so tightly, what's happening, and we can learn to manage it, or I can hmm. give you someone that does do that side. Because there are grief counselors that stick to the six stages of grief. And she said, well, no, that's not what I want. I had looked at your side and da da da. So when I told her what I did, she was a little hesitant. She said, well, I've never heard of that. I said, well, it's because I invented it and it's going to be out there soon. <laughs> And I said, you know, the same way the woman invented the six stages, it's not like that was in a textbook somewhere. She invented that. So um, we did the program. She did this short six week program. Um, and, and she came back and did two more weeks. And we ended up doing eight weeks all together. Um, the last couple of weeks were us really digging into how to deal with her family because they were kind of keeping her in her grief with the 
t-shirts and the gatherings and the constant talking about him and she said i hate the t-shirts i hate wearing those t-shirts you know the rest of peace and all that stuff and she said it was just overwhelming her so she was literally living a life in prison in her grief for her family and so when we got done um i still check in with her usually about every three months or so when we got done she told me you know she had really applied what we talked about it had changed her life she was dating again uh she had cleaned out all of her um husband stuff and gave it to a local charity that was that could use it and she said i kept a few, few mementos that meant something to me and she said i just feel like my life is starting to come full circle she said i will miss him but now i know how to manage when i'm missing him and the grief connected to him so um i love that for her because um she's she's doing well and you can see it was like she went from a darkness around her so when you talk to her see her now there's this light around her she's yeah just like vibrant and, so yeah well so how do you feel when when people come come to you very dark and they go back right how do you feel what's the feeling like I, I see the light that's there or could be there because I remember the darkness around me. I remember I felt like Sally, Sally sorry all the time. I was just Bleh. So I understand it. I get it. When you are out here struggling and you don't know what to do, there's no light around you. You are just, you're a walking ball of fire. You're angry. You're mad. You're sad. You have all this stuff just mixed together like a popcorn ball. And at any moment, you can go, boof. And so I, I totally get it. So when they come like that, I understand they are at the last of, you know, the last of it. There's nothing left because they're getting ready to explode. And if yeah. you explode, some people come back and some people don't. Oh, well, nice. Nice one. Okay, so how do you incorporate spirituality and faith into your group coaching? Um, it depends. I let them know I do consider God to be part of my life. I do consider God to be the one that saved my life because um, I was laying through a, a windshield on the hood of the car, so I shouldn't be here and I was not awake. Um, I was pretty much dead. And so I think God kept me for my son. Um, my other son was laying on the highway and my husband was laying across the highway dead. And the baby was in the car well, he wasn't in the car when he got out of the car, but he was alive. So, I definitely feel like God is, is with us through what, through through the times we need him. There's an angel. I feel like he sent angels down to protect my son. So, I let people know that. But, if you don't feel a spiritual connection, that's okay. I, I respect that. We don't have to add any spirituality into your coaching. But you're gonna hear a little bit here and there because it's always there. So I let them know it's not on purpose, not a push. And most of the time, I've had a few people that don't believe it, but they're like, you know, what I believe it for you, and you make me feel something towards God and towards spirituality. So um, if they want it, it's definitely incorporated. If they say no, I respect that, and I still let God lead me how to help them. Oh, great, great. And for those who are struggling with grief and may not know where to go, what advice do you have for them? For people that have what? Struck, those who are struggling with grief and may not know how and where to turn to for help, what advice do you have for such individuals? Um, go get the help. You can call me, but if you can't find me, go find a grief counselor, go find a grief group, go find a grief coach um, that can help you. I, I always tell people, if you can't get to me, get to somebody. It doesn't matter who it is. Get to somebody. And there you can build on what may be wrong. Sometimes our grief is not, if it's been a very long time, it's not necessarily connected to the person. It could be things around us in our environment that keep putting us back into our, our grief. And so, um, go get some help go talk to somebody and there's tons of ways you can go online you can go on the phone you can go to a physical space but get something out there if you can't afford it find someone that does you know 
low cost or no cost because they're out there there's a few of them out there um that can help you so don't don't look down on it i went to a few things before i found one that worked and that's just the truth you may have to go to more than one grief situation and say oh that was horrible that didn't work that's okay somebody out there like me is going to be able to help you and fix it the lady at my church was the one after two other groups I had been to that really helped me to see I could live again. So the, the, the person or group that can help you is out there. Okay. So um, this is the final question. Uh, what are some practical steps individuals can take to begin the process of healing and finding hope after experiencing a significant loss? Did you get that? What are some steps they can take to process? To do what? Yeah. I said, what are some practical steps individuals can take to begin the process of healing and finding hope after experiencing a significant um, loss? I think the first step is to stop talking to your family and go to a professional. That's a, that's a healing step when we stop talking to friends and family. I know they seem helpful, but they're not the ones. <laughs> Secondly, everyone's processing grief differently. So you have to find the professional to help you. That way you can start to process. Clean your house. Clean your house completely up. People think that's crazy. Clean it out of all the old memories, all the things you don't want. Narrow them down to a few treasure things that you need and keep those and put them in a safe place. You don't need a house full of your husband's clothes or your wife's clothes or your children's clothes. You don't need shrine rooms that are only dedicated to them. That's very dangerous. That can throw you into grief. Um, begin what I call, it's, it's not what I call, there's something called breath work. And when you learn how breath is life, you can begin to stop anytime you need to and do breath work. And, and if they have time, anybody watching the podcast, please look up breath work. It's very easy to do. You can do it from anywhere and it calms you down. That's a healing source to learn how your breath in your body calms you down. And then sit down with yourself. Get a journal. That journal comes everywhere. Hold on. Get a journal, whatever it may be. Okay? And Start writing, start writing in it. And when you start writing in a journal, you can begin to see things that you don't catch in your brain and that you don't always see. You can, and then go back and read the journal weekly and say, oh, wow, I did better this week with that or I'm not doing that anymore. So journaling can be your saving grace. This one is new. I got this from a conference I was on. I haven't used it yet, but I have tons of journals all over that are written in if I pull one of those up. But those are the beginning of the healing part. And start to give yourself love. Self-love and care and say, I love me. I'm still here on the earth. God still has a purpose for me. So I got things to do. And that's where my saying comes from. You got what? You got bigger fish to fry, baby. So you got other things to do besides living your grief. So healing begins when you say, I deserve to live. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. So before we wrap up, um, a lot of people would want to reach out to you, if you don't mind. Can you tell us your contact info so the audience can reach out to you? They can find me across all platforms at Bigger Fish to Fry Coaching on Instagram, Facebook. And my website is www.biggerfishtofrycoaching.com. If you would like to email hey, take me, take it easy, it's... slowly, please. <laughs> oh, so okay. I say it slower. <laughs> all right, let me say it a little bit slower. Across all uh, social media platforms, yeah, I am at Bigger Fish to Fry Coaching. Okay. okay. My website is www.biggerfishtofrycoaching.com. Or you can email me at emward40 at yahoo.com. 
You can also email me through the website. You can DM me on Instagram and DM me on Facebook. I do answer. I don't ignore my DMs. So definitely you can hit me on any of those platforms and I would be I would love to to help you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for the wisdom. Thanks for the insight. Listening to all you have said today, all I just did was to learn, 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 learn. And thank you so much. Like looking at what you went through, losing your husband and your son, and then you didn't allow that to get to you. Instead, you turned it around to start helping people heal through. <laughs> Help people heal through the process. Well, I thank you for having me on today. I appreciate yeah. you letting me tell my story on your podcast. It's, it's, you know, I, I appreciate those that let the story get out there um, because I don't want to ever think that this happened for nothing. Um, so that's why I choose to help people because I'm like, God, you couldn't let this happen for no reason. That's awesome. Okay. Um, we'll, be ra- we'll wrap up right now and we hope to bring you back here to still get some more insights and wisdom for you. So to our viewers, thanks for listening to us and thanks for listening to Eleanor and um we'll see you again on the next episode bye for now bye guys bye everybody all right yeah <laughs>